Hello, my name's Tom Walker and welcome to Imagine, a new series of podcasts which the Focus Employment Hub will be producing to highlight issues of equality and diversity in Merseyside and further afield. And with me is my co-presenter, John Perry, who's the Managing Director of the Focus Employment Hub. John, how's it going? I'm fine, thank you. It's a Friday, so I'm looking forward to the weekend and have that Friday feeling. We're looking forward to doing regular podcasts of a Friday initially on a monthly basis. Before you tell me then about the Focus Employment Hub and the services you provide, tell me about your life as a child growing up and how you lost your sight. Yeah, um, well, it, it sounds a bit of a sob story or a bit of a, you know, one of those things that you see in the films, I guess, but essentially um, I could see up until the age of three and apparently I went to bed and um, my normal practice was obviously my mum to come up and say good night and uh, took me and etc, etc. Um, and this time she came up the stairs, was trying to put me to bed and I said to her, Mum, can you put the light on for me? And apparently it was already on, but she thought I was a child messing about, if you understand what I'm saying. So she thought I was literally just messing about and she thought nothing of it. Went downstairs, went to bed and then woke up the next morning. And the normal practice was for me to have breakfast and a boiled egg. And um, apparently she shouted for me to come down and have my breakfast and I said, Mum, they've taken the stairs away from me. Well, she still thought I was only messing about, but came up and got me and took me downstairs. And then the next thing is uh, I came to the breakfast table and apparently I was feeling around on the table. And then obviously my mum realised then that obviously there was something seriously wrong with me in that sense. Um, I do have spina bifida and hydrocephalus, but up, that, up until that point I could see perfectly. So obviously we went up to the hospital and they diagnosed I was blind. And then there was a discussion about what was going to happen next to me. And apparently the doctor said to my mum, I'm a child of the state. Well, my mum seen red at that point and said, you know, he's not a child of the state, he's my child um, and nobody's going to put my child in special school and not allow him to come home and all that sort of stuff because she didn't want me to go, go to school at that point and stay away from the family. Before we talk about your education, can you remember being fully sighted and can you remember actually losing your sight? I can't actually remember losing my sight. And what I'm about to tell you now is really weird, okay? Because I don't remember a great deal about uh, my losing my sight or indeed being able to see. But what I can, what I can remember is, you know, playing with kids um, when I was younger and um, going to the sweet shop and, and um, being able to see the sweets and, and all of that sort of stuff. And um, uh, dare I say, you know, we used to do things like uh, take milk off people's next doorstep and things like that and I can remember visually in, in my mind's eye um, seeing at that point and what people look like and things like that um, but I can't remember like things how my family looked or my mum looked or my brothers and sisters looked but maybe it was because I used to play with the kids we you know we'd play games we, um, sweets and all that sort of stuff I don't know what it was really um, but that's what I can remember but I don't remember actually losing my sight the story I've just related to you uh, was conveyed to me at a later date and um, so obviously that's their interpretation of, of what went on I certainly can't remember that and apparently when I first went blind um, when I woke up from the operation um, my mum told me that I, I jumped up and, and started singing the yellow submarine and um, I told her, my mum had false teeth at the time and she I told her to take her false teeth out so that that's quite funny so, so I can remember I can remember bits like that um, but I can't remember a great deal about how people looked um, I do have what you would describe as light perception so I could, basically I can see shadows and stuff like that but I can't say for example I'm talking to you now I couldn't look at you and kind of describe how you look or even though you didn't say maybe we were together socially and things like that I couldn't pick you out do you um, dream visually now that's an interesting one isn't it because I believe I do dream visually um, and in my mind's eye I do see when I when I when I dream so you're right uh, or you know the, the, the question is true in that sense that I do actually visualize um, and see in my dreams yes now okay let's move on to your education um, your mum had quite a debate um, I imagine, um, as did mine, and maybe we'll talk about that a bit later on, but we're more interested in you at the moment, John. So tell us about your education and how you ended up going into special school. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think um, in a way, uh, my mum sort of accepted that um, as a visually impaired person or a blind person, she knew nothing, you know, she didn't know anything about blind people and to a, to a certain extent, and this might sound terrible, but, you know, she'd never understood about blind people or, you know, related to blind people and things like that at the time because of course 
that didn't happen all the rest of my family and um cited you know so he'd not experienced that so in the end i ended up going um, to saint Vincent's school for the blind in liverpool um and you know my time there i did actually enjoy uh, i had a reasonable education as far as i wasn't brilliant academically but uh, you know i was okay passed a few cses and things like that the social side was quite good i found the teachers quite helpful and quite support quite supportive i think and it's only on reflection, I guess. Um, what I felt, or looking back on it now, is that uh, we are, we were fairly cosseted in a in a way. Although, because they were trying to teach you to be independent, you're only mixing with um, blind and partially sighted people. And I'm not saying that's a good or a bad thing, but I'm just saying that was the only sort of experience that I had, if you like. Um, but I do remember, and, and, and it just stick in my mind to this day. Um, at the time, um, I guess when finances could allow. Um, we had our own farm and um, I think the idea behind it was that um, rather than being able to see the pigs and the cows you were able to touch the pigs and the cows and things like that and I really did enjoy that um, and we had lots of fields and things like that and um, we had our own built-in private swimming pool and stuff like that so and our own gym so I enjoyed all of that side of things and to, did, sorry, go were you able to go home for the weekend well yeah I mean I, d I did go home for the weekend um, and to be honest with you, a lot of my um, friends lived further afield, so some of them certainly didn't go on for the weekend, but I did. Um, now, in a way, that was a, a, a good thing. I, I mean, I did really enjoy that, because um, I was mixing with um, my sighted friends and non-disabled people in that sense. But of course, come Monday, I then went back to school, and they carried on living their lives with their other friends and, and, and moved on in their own way. And I had to then come back in and then engage again and get involved. So in a way, again, on reflection, I probably think um, that was a difficult experience because I was having to try and maintain friends in both in both sides and kind of losing contact with my sighted friends when I left. And that certainly happened later on in life, you know, as I, as I went on. That certainly mirrors my experience as yeah. well. Initially, when I went home from Wavertree School for the Blind, um, I went back to Manchester and I would know quite a lot of people of a similar age but then gradually as I got older they, they moved on and uh, I lost contact with them. Was, was that your experience? It was yeah and um, you know even playing together in the street and things like that or playing football and things like that um, all of those sort of things you know I, th I think that tended to stop as I got older and things like that um partly because of the way society went you know that um i mean my mom ended up um not allowing me to play in the street and um in a, kind of got the grass taken out of the front so that i could play in the path but people obviously would come up and chat to me and things like that but of course i was now playing football on my own in the path if that makes sense <laughs> so so there was a, a degree of isolation in that as well because i remember I, I i have an older brother and he he, he basically taught me to walk. Uh, I, I did come to walking quite late, uh, about the age of two or something like that. Um, but he did really well on the horses when he was younger. And um, he used to buy me, um, you know, like toy cars that I could drive in. And I'd go around in the street, you know, and, and round on a bike in the street and all those sort of things when I was, when I was younger, you know, so. Yeah. Fond memories. Um, you said as well that you did have some fond memories of uh, St. Vincent's School for the Blind. What was the quality of education like that? I think it was very good. You know, I mean, in my perception was it, it was very good. I mean, obviously I didn't have, a, to, at that point, I didn't have any other experiences, I guess. Um, but it did felt as though it was good. I mean, the teachers treated me really well. And my recollection of myself was that I was a, I was a good pupil in terms of, uh, I didn't get myself any bad conduct marks as, as I remember, but other people might remember it differently, I don't know. Uh, I hope the teachers remember me fondly, but I mean, I did get on with most of my teachers um, and things like that, and they did do the best for me. In fact, there was one particular teacher, an English teacher, who, who I, I thought was really good, called Frank McFarlane, and he introduced me to um, Animal Farm as a book, um, um, The Pearl by John Steinbeck, and um, that sort of informed my social thinking to a little extent um, as I've gotten old as I've got older you know so you talked there about uh, how you had a good education at St Vincent's and you enjoyed it and you've also talked about how you gradually lost touch with people in your local community were you ever able to regain that contact locally yeah I think um, 
I guess like a lot of disabled people and visually impaired people, I spent the majority of my earlier life in special education. So I went on um, to go to places like um, Surrey and Hereford, uh, London and places like that. And um, these were to specialist blind colleges. Exactly, yeah. And, and all of them were kind of specialist blind colleges kind of thing. So I guess um, we're looking at sort of my early 20s before I sort of reintegrated back into the community um, in my sort of local community or live fully if you know what I mean um, and but I think I'm fairly easy to get on with and I get on pe with people quite well so I did feel as I was able to readjust and kind of settle back in and get on with the people that I knew and, and to this day although I live in St Helens in Merseyside now um, you know I have uh, people that I speak to in St Helens but I've still got um, people who I talk to in, in my local Liverpool area where I originally came from and I still go back and have a drink with family and friends and things like that back in Liverpool. So I think um, I haven't lost touch with all of those sort of people, but obviously they've grown up in different ways and lived their lives in different ways as I have as well, I guess. John, you've talked about your uh, school education. What happened after you left St Vincent School for the Blind? Yeah, um, well, to be honest with you, um, I was left twiddling my thumbs for a little bit um, when I first came and um, no real contact with support and stuff like that, you know, in terms of looking for employment and stuff like that. And then the employment advice I was given at the time was uh, in order for me to move up, get a job, I'd probably need to move away to London. Well, if you remember what I said to you earlier on about losing contact with family and friends and things like that, I thought, oh, not again, you know, I'm not going to do that again because I've already started to build up relationships and things like that and stay in my own community. Um, so I... I guess I didn't take um, the advice up on, on that time. But then I was listening to a programme on um, Radio 4 about employment. And um, there was a, a place called the Green Bank Project mentioned in Liverpool. I think it's changed its name now to the Green Bank College, if memory serves me correctly. Um, but I went there and um, had a look round. Now, there was a print department uh, there and um, I was interested in that side of things. I don't really know why, but it kind of just struck me um, that I might be interested in that. Um, and I asked whether it would be possible for me to come and do some training in the print department there. Now, um, apparently, even there, although it was supposed to be for non-disabled and disabled people, they were saying, now oh, we're going to have a visually impaired person in the print department and all that sort of stuff. Um, but it turns out that the instructor was quite supportive of me wanting to do this and gave me the opportunity to, to do so. Um, so I went initially as a trainee um, and learned the print trade, uh, including things like photography, um, letterpress, um, typesetting, um, all various bits and pieces, and then went to work in a workers cooperative, which they had um, available at the time, which was uh, run by the project and stuff like that. So I did work um, for them f for a while and then trained. Uh, unfortunately, the cooperative closed and then I retrained as a counsellor, but I had to go into mainstream education at uh, a local college in Liverpool. Now, to be fair, um, the tutor was excellent there in terms of supporting my needs as a blind person. And um, a lot of people have this perception that you need to be able to see and, uh, you know, look at visual cues and things for that with counselling. Well, that was not the approach by my counsellor who, who was training me at the time. So I trained and I started off at basic, intermediate and the equivalent to like a, a, a degree in counselling um, with the college and then done stuff around that. Before we talk about the counselling, you also attended some specialist colleges in Hereford and in London. Tell us about those. Yeah, um, well, the, um, the I guess the first one was um, a, a rehab place um, in, in Surrey. Now, to be honest with you, um, although I did enjoy my time there, I didn't really see a lot of what we were doing relating to my life as such. I mean, we, we were taught to wire plugs and this to this day i've never wired a plug in my life and you know i don't really see the need for it or the point of it yeah um i guess there was a purpose to it at the time i only did that for about 12 months um but so i guess that was okay um and then um i also attended rnc for two years doing a commercial training uh training course with, that's the royal national college yeah yeah rnc yeah and um so i did like commercial training but i also did a number of o levels there as well um and so got a few O levels under my belt and different things like that as well. Uh, now, I, I did find my time quite good there. I, I enjoyed it. And obviously, a lot of the people that I went through school with uh, 
were all also at the same college as well. So I guess there wasn't the need to, to rebuild relationships and things like that as well. But again, I suppose the other side of that was that, that you lost contact with, again, with uh, your non-disabled friends and, and family and things like that. So um, having said that, I did enjoy the time there. I also went to Pembridge College, uh, which was like a, I did t a telephony course there as well. And again, that was a special college as well. And again, um, weirdly enough, um, through Facebook and social media, some of my old friends who I knew then, and bear in mind, this was only like a six or seven week course, have now got in contact with me through Facebook and stuff like that. So um, I guess you could say I've reconnected with some people that literally I was supposed to be in, uh, in my 20s or something like that at the time, but we've reconnected and things like that. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, by and large, I think my time I found enjoyable there. Now you've told us that you were uh did your counselling course at a mainstream college. That's so correct. Have you reflected on the difference between being in mainstream and being at a specialist college and what conclusions did you reach? Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, I've, I've gone on really since then to do O-levels in mainstream and uh, my counselling and also I've done a postgraduate course at university and stuff like that. So uh, in a way, I've gone the other way now and, then, and, a lot, and I've also done a management qualification at, at mainstream college and stuff. Um, and so um, my reflections, are, I guess, are twofold in a sense. I personally would like to see the day that we are all in included and integrated um, into mainstream and to live and work and play alongside each other. But I can see that unless it's adequately resourced, um, some of those issues are kind of utopian in a sense. Um, so that's the way it feels for me. And I also think, um, unless you kind of with me i'm quite mouthy and chatty and, and speak up for myself so unless you're quite confident in the first place it might be difficult and also um because my background is in equality diversity and kind of i understand equality legislation and stuff like that i've been able to challenge for want in a better way the system so that i get my needs met but if you're not a uh, dare I say, and I hope this comes across the right way, but articulate or kind of ready to be assertive and challenging, you're going to kind of lose out, I think. But I personally found it a good experience. I started off, I guess, my main sort of employment in uh, the print trade. So I started off and then I went out to do counselling and, and um, I've gone on to do either counselling um, employment or be self-employed over the years. Um, and I think um, to a certain extent, I've found that road relatively easy in the sense um, because I've worked in the type of field that I've been working in. However, some of the attitudes from um, perhaps certainly in my earlier life with, with the job centres and other organisations um, who, who you would have thought were out there to support disabled people, maybe quite negative and stuff. So. Tell me about the kinds of attitude you encountered. Well, I, well, I think um, there was an assumption when I went to the first job centre um, that okay I'm blind so um, I'd, I don't need to sign on um, I don't need to look for work and things like that as well um, and also um, a, a bit of an assumption that um, I wasn't as capable as, as I could be I mean certainly even from my early school days um, and I guess this might be true of a lot of blind people I don't know but the assumption would at the time was uh, I, my mum was told um, or at least when I had my interview to look at what I was going to do at school um, the person said to my mum uh, what does John want to do and she <laughs> and she said don't ask me ask John you know and then um, it was assumed I think at the time that I would only ever be a telephonist um, now you could argue at the time that um, most people were like piano tuners or telephonists and things like that and I guess the other argument might be that I wasn't ready to do some of the things that I've done now but the other argument is well maybe I could have been in a different place earlier than I might have been if that makes sense. Just in case listeners are wondering a cat has joined us called Lenin and this is your cat isn't it? It is my lovely cat who's been with me through thick and thin. <laughs> All right so just in case people are wondering what the noise is it's nothing untoward it's just Lenin the cat yeah. that's lovely. Um, what about employers John when you were going for jobs and yeah. interviews and things like that what 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 were their attitudes? Yeah well, well interestingly enough um, a, a number of it I mean I probably like everybody else whether you're non-disabled or disabled um, I was quite enthusiastic, you know, when I retrained and, and, and all of that sort of thing, and I was firing off applications and CVs. And at the time, uh, my mum was helping me to write 
you know, letters and send things off. And, and, you know, you'd either get no responses or you'd get letters saying yes, but no thanks or whatever. Um, but what what sticks in my mind was, was a couple of things really. As, um, that, and you could argue this is not necessarily to do with my disability, but um, one, one of the O levels I did was uh, around um, political studies. And I remember applying for a, a telephony job um, with the Ministry of Defence. And um, the guy said to me, he said to me, are you a communist? I said, what? I said, no, why? He said, well, you've done all level political studies. So I said, well, I'm, I've done RE, but I'm not a priest, you know. So um, I, th I think there's kind of been sort of ne negative experiences from that. And you're never quite sure whether people are refusing you on the grounds of your disability or you're not capable. And I guess going back to my earlier comments about mixing with blind people all the time, you kind of don't know what other people's expectations are of you and things like that and what the real world is, is looking for you. But I always remember um, when I was at college, I was told that in order to get on as a disabled person, I'd have to be 100% better than non-disabled people. Um, and I've, I, I, but my mum always said to me, you know, never think that you're inferior to everybody. And I've, ne I've never really seen myself as being, being like that, I guess. But the other side of that is that if you appear a bit kind of standoffish or as though you're like, you're better than everybody else, although it's not your intention, uh, that might come across as that way. Um, although that was never really the intention, you know. And certainly my friend, my family have been re very supportive of my um, way to go in life and stuff. We spoke about your, uh, some of your employment career. Tell us what the highlights have been. Yeah, um, I think um, reflecting back on it, I mentioned the Greenback Project before, and I guess that was quite good in a way because I'd never ever experienced um, working in the print trade or, or, or doing stuff like that. And I guess it was my first real opportunity. Um, and, you know, I was so happy that I was given the opportunity and stuff like that. So I did enjoy that. I also worked um, for Henshaw Society for the Blind and Christopher Grange um, and also uh, the brain, the brain charity in Liverpool. What were your jobs there? Um, it was all around sort of counselling, providing emotional, practical support, and employment support, um, and uh, all of those sort of issues. Um, and I've also been self-employed as well, offering offering similar services as well. Um, but all of my experiences, whether it be at the, you know, whether it be at the Green Bank Project, whether it be at the Brain Charity, Henshaws, and Christopher Grange, and indeed my self-employment, have also kind of shaped the way of thought or and to be honest with you um if i strip it down um my ethos is about supporting and helping the individual if it, that doesn't sound too twee um so because i was able to do that in some shape or form and be paid for it of course that that, that was a bonus um but i have worked in a paid and voluntary capacity for the older center and a number of other places as well um so they've all if you like offered me something or taught me something and the friends and colleagues that I've worked with have been good to work with as well. So when we look at your jobs at uh, Christopher Grange, at Henshaws and the Brain Charity, the one skill that unifies them is counselling. Um, tell me about the skills that you need to be a counsellor and whether being visually impaired helps or hinders. What I would say is, um, from my own personal perspective, um, this might sound a strange thing for me to say, although you know, I do realize I'm a blind person, yeah? Um, I don't see myself as a blind person and I don't kind of dwell on that too much, yeah? That said, um, from a counseling point of view, uh, I made reference earlier on to um, my initial tutor saying to me, you know, most people would say that you need to be able to see because you need to look at the visual cues and things like that. But you know, when we're talking, we all tend to, um, react in certain ways so for example if you're feeling down you know people's body posture might change so you can hear that um, also you can hear it in people's voices when people are changing them um, and the other thing is um, and I made reference to this in a conversation I was having in another forum on a, on a local radio station in Liverpool the other day is that um, maybe because I can't see the individual uh, people think I'm not actually judging them or not judging them visually or all of those sort of things. Now, I w and the other thing that's happened to me as well is when I was growing up, I was always told that I was a good listener. Um, and so I suppose I've kind of professionalized or formalized that as well. But I've also been told that, that as a person, 
when people are in my company, I tend to put them put them at ease, whether that be you know on a personal level or a professional level. People say that to me, and so in a way, um, I think as long as I can kind of demonstrate empathy. To a certain extent, um, and I'm not trying to rubbish academic or theoretical approaches to counselling, but to a certain extent, people don't ask you what qualifications you got. They don't ask you what, what they want to know is, are you going to help them through their particular thing? Are you going to listen to them? And are you going to help them achieve their objective? Um, Talking about listening, um, one popular misconception, of course, is that blind people have better hearing than sighted people. Yes. I often explain that that isn't the case, but maybe we're more attentive than sighted people to audio cues, people's voices. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, I agree with that analysis. You know, um, it's like um, a lot of people assume that blind people have perfect pitch. Well, you know, I can't sing for toffee, although I'll do karaoke. Um, you know, I'm not a good musician or anything like that. I can vouch for that. <laughs> but, um, but you know, so, so all of those sort of things. Um, I think I agree with you that, um, and I've said this to other people, to be honest with you, because we're having to use our hearing a lot more, maybe we're more attuned or more attentive to what's going on around us. Talking of counselling and listening to people, you have recently set up the Focus Employment Hub in St Helens. It's your brand new, bang up to date venture. Tell me what you're aiming to do. Okay, from a personal level, I've realized within myself um, that self-employment is probably better suited to my type of personality. Tell me why, first of all. I think being self-employed suits me as a person, partly because um, I'm able to manage the lifestyle that I want and choose the hours I want to work. And obviously, uh, as long as I know that I'm financially okay, um, choose the way I want to work. I think also I can influence what I want to do and decide what I don't want to do and all of those sort of things. Um, and I genuinely feel more relaxed and enjoy that lifestyle. I always used to say, um, you know, one week I might be eating in Aldi and the next week I might be eating in Marks and Spencers, but that doesn't bother me. So I just enjoy that particular lifestyle of being self-employed. I've led you astray a little bit because I asked you about why you enjoy being self-employed. And what I should be asking you about is the Focus Employment Hub. What happened was um, I I'd lost my wife several years ago. And um, if I'm honest, um, I'd gone back into paid employment or PAYE employment, partly because um, it gave me more structure and stability and things like that while I was trying to um, come to terms with my wife, long-term illness, and then uh, a passing over and stuff like that. Uh, but I then re reached a, a, a time where I thought, well, the time is to move on now. So in a way, um, I'm wanting to kind of address the needs of disabled people in the wider community and offering the similar support that I've offered before. But also, I'm more acutely aware now that with the pandemic and the virus, that I believe, and the academic research seems to highlight this, that minority groups and disabled people uh, are experiencing hardship greater than the non-disabled uh, community. Now, that's not to say, of course, that the non-disabled community are not experiencing difficulties. In fact, what I would say to you is, my whole ethos is about in inclusion and equality and diversity. And I would say, you know, whether you're non-disabled or disabled, we all have similar aspirations. And those opportunities you know, may be proving difficult for certain sections of the communities, be you non-disabled or disabled or, or from a, a BAME community. So from a practical point of view, what does Focus Employment do? Well, the name's a bit uh, misleading in a way because it says Focus Employment Hub. So I guess the primary service might be around employment and support and consultancy for disabled people and people with long-term illnesses. However, we do provide counselling for, for a range of individuals and groups. And um, we also do advocacy, provide advocacy. Um, I'm also happy to look at communication for disabled people and also general stuff around benefits. So I guess it's a range of things really. And we've also uh, recently started a life coaching service, which is basically open to the whole community. And that's about saying to people, you know, whatever your goals are, we'll try and help to, you to achieve them, whether they be personal goals or professional goals. So we, we've started that. So there's a, there's a range of things, I guess. And from my own perspective, going forward, 
I'd like to see us working with the wider community, whether it be the non-disabled community or experiencing difficulty, the BAME community or indeed uh, the disabled community. Now, I know it's early days, but uh, how have things gone so far? Yeah, um, well, we were reflecting on it the other day, actually, because um, Jane, who, who's my PA, has been with me for about 12 months now. And I think, generally speaking, although Focus existed on paper, it has only actually been going for about 12 months. And Jane and other people have said to me, God, you haven't half done quite a lot in 12 months and things like that. But when you're doing it, you don't kind of think about that. Um, I've also brought in... Um, uh, business advice now to, to help me kind of build on and, and do what it you know build on what we're doing at the moment and try and help me to secure funding um to maybe offer more free services and things like that as well because um we have we offer um a mixed service in the sense that some of our services are free because we're able to have, at, attract funding but um, for well not unfortunately but we also have to charge for our services as well um so the, the ideal scenario might be to be funded either self-financing or obtain grants to offer more free services in the future and to also recruit and retain um, and people uh, through our employment support and things like that and to work on our behalf and things like that so whether that be a, as a freelance or whether it be as a PAYE post uh, I guess that's another side of things yeah so you've been going for 12 months. How do you see the future for uh, Focus Employment yeah, Hub, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, the next, say, two, three years? Yeah, yeah. Um, as I say, I'd like to, I'd like, in my head, um, from a kind of idealistic point of view, I'd like to believe that we've in some way played our part to bring about change. Um, from a practical point of view, I'd like to be more self-sufficient financially. And then the other level might be that we, are, we recruit people from... Uh, in quotes disadvantaged or minority groups uh, to, to provide opportunities for them as well. What advice would you have for blind and partially sighted people who are either stuck in jobs that they just don't like or finding it difficult to find work in the first place? What would you say to them? What have your lessons been over the years? Yeah. Um, I'd like to reflect on something I said to you earlier. Um, my mum always used to say to me, you know, don't believe that you can't do anything or don't believe that anybody's better than you you know so i think strive for your ambition whether you're a visually impaired person a non-disabled person or, or from other some community is strive for what you actually want and try to believe in what you want and i think if you can i mean it sounds a bit twee this but to a certain extent i think if you can think it you can have it i want to talk a little bit more about equality uh, for blind and partially sighted people and disabled people more generally but you'll be fully aware, of course, of the figures. A huge percentage of blind and partially sighted people are unemployed, and that's mirrored in disabled people as well. Why do you think that is, and what needs to be done to remedy that, to sort that out? Essentially, I think it, it in part attitudes, or maybe a lot of that big part is attitudes. So I think people believe in that visually impaired disabled people are not capable of doing certain things. And I think that's still you know to this day it still exists and so i think that's about trying to address the attitudes now i i'm trying to do my bit i guess in, in providing the sort of support that i'm offering uh, but equally i think the individual needs to take control of that themselves and believe in or get help to, to believe you know to help them achieve their particular goals I think from an organisational point of view, whether that be you know, at a, a, um, a local authority level or any level really in the business community or wherever, I think they need to kind of think about their attitudes towards employing disabled people. You know, there's obviously things like disability confidence and, and, and a lot of people sort of frown on stuff like that because they say, well, it's just people ticking boxes and things like that as well. And to a certain extent, you know, I can, I can agree with that. But I also believe that, you know, positive action programs, symbols and all of those sort of things play some part in at least trying to highlight the issues if they don't totally address them. Um, Can you understand why employers might be in some way reticent yeah. to employ uh, disabled people? Yeah, well, I think there's a bit of a misnomer in a sense, because I think a lot of um, employers think it's going to cost them an absolute fortune. Um, or the disabled person is going to be less confident, 
all sorts of range of issues and things like that but they don't recognize that there is help and support both financially and practically out there and they may not need, even need to pay for those sort of things um, and so I think there's that perception and you could argue you know you could argue that um, blind people might be a bit slower at doing whatever um, all of those sort of things I guess for me it's about giving them the opportunity and building in either a level of support or making reasonable adjustments. And by that, I mean, you know, in my case, I need a screen reader, you know, to, to uh, use a computer. You know, I can't physically drive, but I have access to a car, uh, which I have a PA who, who supports me um, to drive, you know, supports me with some of the things that I can't do, which is being paid for through access to work. Um, and I realised that some of these, some of the navigation through these services and systems can be difficult. But I think if we work with employers and individuals to kind of help people realise that there is help out there, then that might be the way forward. I, but I think there needs to be a kind of a, a major shift in the way people think. And how you do that, I don't think you can do it like tomorrow. But I think if you keep chipping away, then that needs to happen. I think... Um, there's some issues around um, legislation in that, you know, people are terrified about uh, what they might have to do, how it might cost, are they going to get taken to court, are they going to do X, Y and Z. But I think if employers were more proactive, then they would be less likely to find themselves in that sort of trap. You must be reading my mind because I was going to ask you about legislation. You speak to any group of disabled people about employment and inevitably the Disability Discrimination Act and the Equality Act will come up. Yeah. Do you think those pieces of legislation need to be strengthened? Yeah, I would say uh, the, the short answer is, is yes, yes. Uh, and it does need to be reinforced. And, um, you know, where action is needed, it needs to be taken. So words are not enough. So it's actions and deeds that we're looking for, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, John, um, just before we go, um, we're hoping to encourage people to get involved in this podcast, aren't we? We most definitely are. I'd love to hear from you through my social media or any other way that you'd like to contact me. And I'd love to hear your contributions. And indeed, if you want to get directly involved, that's fine. So I hope you've enjoyed the first one. And dear listener, or if there's more than one, that will be great. And that's now in the can. Thank you very much for my first one. It is indeed in the can, John Perry. Thank you very much indeed for your time and thanks to everybody for listening. Goodbye.